Hello. Welcome to today's 12th webinar in the Making Sense webinar series, Meeting Future Refrigeration and Energy Reduction with Today's Technology Alternatives, brought to you by Emerson Climate Technologies. I'm Alan Wisher, and I'm your moderator today. We have a few announcements before we begin. Please note that this presentation's audio is not provided by phone number, but only through your computer's sound system, so be sure to turn up your computer's volume. You may ask an online question at any time throughout today's presentation by clicking on the question mark icon located in the floating toolbar at the edge of your screen. Simply type your question into the text area and hit send. Please keep the send to default set as all panelists. Now on to the presentation, meeting future refrigeration energy reduction with today's technology alternatives. Discussing today's topic will be Kurt Kanapke, Vice President of Engineering and Electronics, Emerson Climate Technologies, and Brian Binasek, Refrigeration Engineer, Emerson Climate Technologies. The webinar will now begin. Brian will get us started. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. We're going to focus on three types of um, commercial refrigeration equipment today. Um, what the Department of Energy classifies as commercial refrigeration equipment, which we often call um, reach-ins or self-contained display cases. We're also going to cover um, walk-in coolers and freezers, as well as uh, commercial ice makers. Now, all of these pieces of commercial refrigeration equipment, all these types of equipment, are currently covered under some sort of energy regulation. But, um, as you can see from the dates here, the Department of Energy has issued final rulings uh, to increase the energy efficiency of all these types of equipment. And although those dates, you know, are about two to two and a half years away still, um, and there are some legal challenges coming from the industry, uh, really equipment manufacturers at this point are taking this seriously and they're looking at ways to uh, improve the energy efficiency of these types of equipment. Uh, let me explain just briefly how energy is measured uh, for these types of equipment. For commercial refrigeration equipment, the metric is uh, kilowatt hours uh, per day. Uh, for walk-in coolers and freezers, there is an energy metric called uh, AWEF, annual walk-in uh, energy factor. And ice makers um, are measured in the amount of power that's used to make 100 pounds of ice, regardless of you know, how much ice that ice maker makes in a 24-hour period. Um, and each class of equipment has certain equations that are associated with it for what the maximum energy efficiency can be. Um, for reach-ins with doors, it's the uh, total volume of that, internal volume of that piece of equipment. For open display cases, it's the uh, total display area, the open area. As I mentioned, um, walk-in coolers and freezers have that AWEF metric, uh, which is uh, calculated, but it's largely based on the uh, system capacity, um, you know, maximum system capacity of that type of equipment. and. Uh, ice makers, again, depends on the, the harvest rate of that type of equipment. And we'll get into each of one of those in a little bit more detail. So first, commercial refrigeration equipment. Um, when you break it down between, uh, you know, low-temp freezers and medium-temp refrigerators, all the different types of configurations of equipment, uh, there's actually about 50 classes of equipment that the Department of Energy has defined. And each one of those classes has different uh, energy equations associated with it for calculating what the maximum energy you know, consumption can be. Um, I, the question I get asked most often, however, is, is my product class covered under the energy regulations? And we wanted to point out right away um, that there are certain classes that might be considered reaching uh, that are not covered. Um, and those would involve a lot of salad bars, refrigerated food prep tables, and buffet tables. Um, the, uh, the distinction is, if it's, a, if it's a prep table that just has a reach-in refrigerator underneath it. Uh, that reach-in refrigerator with the door is covered under the energy regulations. However, if the refrigeration piece of equipment kind of does double duty, if it keeps pans cool or it keeps the, the food prep trays cool, um, then there's no test procedure right now uh, for coming up with the daily energy consumption, and that type of a pe uh, piece of equipment would not be covered under the energy regulations. Um, again, the second one we mentioned is uh, walk-in coolers and freezers. This presentation is very much focused on um, the condensing unit side of that. There's also the evaporator fan coil assembly, or what you know is called the unit cooler in the industry, and also the envelope. But we're very focused on the condensing unit. And when Kurt uh, presents in a little bit, he's going to talk about uh, some of the 
technology design options that are available, you know, to, to meet these levels uh, from a condensing unit or a system standpoint. Um, if you want to hear a lot of detail about the calculations of AWEF and, and what they mean, our last Making Sense webinar, which we just did in October of last year, covers that in great detail, and, and that's available on the Emerson Climate website, and you can, um, you know, you can go to that and refer back to that. The, the third piece is the, uh, of, that we're going to talk about today is uh, commercial ice makers, um, batch cubers, uh, as well as continuous machines, which are sometimes called flakers or nuggets. Now, the equipment manufacturers that make this type of equipment understand these ratings really well because, you know, energy levels are going back about 15 years on this type of equipment. Uh, when Energy Star uh, first came up with you know, uh, regulations, not minimum levels, but what would you, what kind of energy efficiency would you need to meet Energy Star? And of course, those levels have gone up over the years, as and so has the uh, the uh, DOE. So uh, that's that's that. And one thing I wanted to point out, though, again, I get asked a lot: Are frozen carbonated beverage machines fall into this? They do not. Uh, neither do what you might call slushy machines or icy machines. Uh, soft serve ice cream. Right now, uh, those product classes are not covered, and there are no, um, you know, DOE minimums. So, here's kind of those three pieces of equipment we talked about again. Um, and what I've listed on the bottom there is the AHRI uh, test standard that covers how those pieces of equipment are tested and rated. Uh, AHRI makes their standards um, publicly available. You can find them on the AHR website, or, or by Googling them, you can download the uh, PDF. But the standard doesn't set the minimum level. The, the test standard only tells you, you know, what the test procedure is, how the piece of equipment is tested, under what conditions is the subject to. For example, commercial refrigeration equipment is tested in a 75-degree Fahrenheit uh, ambient test room, while uh, ice machines are tested in a 90-degree ambient test room. And so this chart kind of shows, you know, what some of those conditions are. The walk-ins probably are the most complicated. Uh, a lot of um, outdoor, you know, a lot of walk-ins have outdoor condensing units, and those are subject to um, three different ambient conditions, starting with 95 degrees Fahrenheit and going down to 59 and 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So, the, the, the standard explains how to test those and then how to do the math. You have to go to the DOE website to look for the energy equations that specify what the minimum efficiency level has to be. Or if you're trying to meet Energy Star levels, you would go to the EPA website, and they list for every product class, you know, an equation that you would plug in that variable, whether that's the, the harvest rate per day or the volume or whatever it is, you know, it'll tell you what the minimum uh, efficiency needs to be. There's also higher tiers. Uh, the Consortium for Energy Efficiency, uh, CEE, has, you know, higher energy tiers, and, and other countries have tiers that kind of work along the same lines as, as well, such as Canada and Mexico. So just to make it clear, the AHRI is just the test standard explains how to test the piece of equipment. So here's the chart that talks about the compliance. Now, the Department of Energy maintains a certification database, a compliance database, and equipment manufacturers are required to submit, you know, verification that their equipment meets the minimum efficiency levels. And you can go right now to the Department of uh, Energy website and look for their uh, certification database. So this isn't new. I mean, these energy regulations, these energy efficiency minimums have been around for these pieces of equipment. Uh, you know, what's going to be changing in a couple of years is the, the stringency or how hard it is to achieve those levels, which is why we put this webinar together. Um, as far as all the calculations and everything go, if you want a little bit more detail on that, uh, Emerson Climate Technologies has a white paper, which you can download for free from our website, uh, that talks about commercial refrigeration and all these energy regulations and shows some uh, example calculations for all these types of equipment. Um, the, the one takeaway from this slide here is, you know, these are the dates that new equipment has to meet the guidelines. Uh, you know, we've said that replacement equipment can be, or equipment that's already in the field can be non-compliant. That's not actually the right wording. I mean, it has to comply with the energy levels that are in effect right now, but these energy levels, again, uh, apply to equipment that's manufactured, you know, on or, or after that date. So just to be clear, just to be clear there. The DOE realizes that there's going to be an impact to the channel. They've had a lot of stakeholder meetings over the last three years, you know, to try to explain this. Really, I think, for the people that are on this call, the big effect is going to be cost and space. Uh, 
the DOE does not, you know, expect that this, these types of equipment are going to be able to meet these new stringent energy levels without a little bit of added cost. And I think we're going to talk about some design technology options today that, you know, typically will have some cost added to that piece of equipment. The other thing that you might find if you're laying out, uh, uh, you know, food service or laying out a restaurant is the, the space that the piece of equipment takes um, may, may increase, you know, based on the need for some, some of these uh, refrigeration technologies such as larger heat exchangers or whatnot. Really, you know, what you can do is if you're concerned about the cost of the space, you know, talk to your equipment manufacturer or, or talk to your equipment dealer or distributor about what this is going to mean and what's coming. Uh, so, you know, so to make sure that you're prepared um, to handle these types of equipment. That brings us to our first polling question. Um, are you aware of these Department of Energy uh, energy regulations? So if, if you would please answer, A, you're not aware at all, or you're somewhat aware, you're completely aware. Uh, with that, I will turn this over to Kurt. I'll give you a second to answer those questions, and, and Kurt will take us into these system options. Okay, in a little bit here, we'll be able to take a, a quick look at how everyone on the webinar actually responded to this. And from our initial um, discussion, our webinar last time, we realized that the majority of the people were fell in the not aware or somewhat aware. Um, very few were completely aware. If we look at the polling results from this time, we've seen a, a dra dramatic shift to at least getting some basic awareness um, out there. And there seems to be some technical difficulty in exactly what options are out there, but the majority are moving to somewhat aware. And the third option was supposed to be completely aware. Um, and I'm assuming that the 26% answered that, um, realized that, and answered accordingly. But moving forward, this slide shows if we can get rid of the polling box. You can see half of the left-hand side, um, and basically what I tried to do was to provide um, a list of possible levers that equipment manufacturers can um, manage and pull and make changes to to meet these DOE regulations. Um, this, we are already engaged with multiple equipment manufacturers to look at what equipment exists um, in their space and what options they have to uh, make changes in order to meet the appropriate regulations that are out there. Um, and we're evaluating um, options to provide the best return on investment they can make, both considering design time and the initial or cost of buying that equipment, as well as the total cost of operating that equipment. And if you look at the slide, you can see that there's kind of we're kind of grouped into two main areas: um, devices that actually consume energy, and then as well as a design option that you can change on the system that has nothing to do with uh, consuming electrical energy itself, but has a huge impact on system performance. You can see there's things like operating with the most efficient compressor. And that could include things like, you know, adding a run cap to your um, condensing unit, um, choosing a different compression technology, whether it's hermetic, semi-hermetic, or scroll compression or other compression technology, using a enhanced vapor injection, 
or moving to variable speed, uh, leveraging the energy efficiency that the BPM motor actually provides. There's also considerations on your fan motors using ECM fan motors or using uh, variable speed fan motors as well. You can see for the ice machines, you can also improve your auger motor. And then you can see on the right hand slide, various system improvements such as floating your head, improving your coil, um, improving your defrost, you know, exploring alternative refrigerants and other options that you can um, try to implement into your system looking for levers you can pull to meet those energy regulations that are stated from the DOE. The green dots are meant to um, signify where we think there's a potential impact for those various classifications of equipment that Brian introduced you to. So that's the commercial equipment, the walk-in um, coolers and freezers, and the ice makers where appropriate. The check marks actually signify a few of the examples that Brian and I will um, walk you through today, and we'll talk a little bit about the efficiency from that specific topic alone, and also give an example of how that impacts the actual DOE regulations in terms of the way that they would actually measure those pieces of equipment um, appropriately. So you can not only see the impact of the component, but you can also see what the system impact is overall. This launches us into our second polling question. And this is just a general question on, just to get us a feel of, is your organization doing anything at this point to meet the upcoming regulation? And there's various um, options you can select here. As you know, you're doing nothing today and really have no plans to. Or, you know, you're currently taking, you're not taking any actions, but you're currently planning to take actions or you're currently taking some actions, or you're fully invested with your resources and you're well into your um, plan and believe that you will take the necessary actions to meet the appropriate DOE requirements. We'll wait a few moments just to see what those results are. As we've gone down this journey, we've uh, inter engaged in OEMs that we've seen um, fully engaged, and as well as um, some that were, you know, just going through the educational process. And we've seen multiple OEMs engage Emerson um, into a process, and we've helped them uh, move down their path. So I'd invite everyone on the webinar, if you're not in that engagement process to really reach out to your Emerson representative and begin that engagement process um, in the near future, whether that's educational or you've got a overall um, plan and you're currently down the path just to you know, inform us what you're doing and where you're going. Um, as we can see the results um, here, it looks like you're split, you know, there's a few that have no plans, no actions, and equally conservative between the other options, ruffling about, you know, almost up to 20% is, you know, they're taking some action and we're moving through the plans appropriately. I'd like to again invite you to um, contact your Emerson representative to engage more um, in the near future. Now onto the, our first topic about um, taking advantage of low condensing um, options that are available in your systems. You can see the chart here represents a bin analysis. Um, that's the black line for the Kansas City location. Um, the, the AWEF or walk-in energy standard is actually based on the Kansas City bin hours. And you can see the number of hours that you spent at the various ambient temperatures So if you actually look at the hours spent above 100 degrees ambient, they're very few and far between. And if you look at the hours spent you know, below 40, there's quite a bit um, of the hours that are there. Um, and you can see that we plotted the appropriate 
compressor efficiencies with a 20 degree temperature differential across your condenser. And you can see where the compression technologies um, lie in with their performance. As you go down in ambient temperature, therefore reducing the condensing temperature, you can see there's a systematic improvement in overall compression efficiency with the scroll and semi-hermetic actually taking a larger advantage towards the lower ambience. The hermetic compressor is actually stopped at a 70 degree ambient. That's because the minimum condensing temperature that is currently approved is only down to 70 degrees condensing, which would correspond to a 50 degree ambient temperature. So the majority of the systems today have a minimum of 90 degree condensing. And with the 20 degree temperature differential that we have here, that would equate to a 70 degree ambient. So you can see you're benefiting from lowering your ambient temperatures from you know, the 100 degree range down to the 70 degree range. But at that efficiency level, you're really capping the efficiency of your equipment and for the majority of the rest of the year, you're maintaining at that energy efficiency level, or EER as we like to call it, um, and you're actually wasting the energy performance or increase in energy efficiency that you can gain by allowing your systems to flow down to those lower condensing temperatures. So we've actually noticed that a few years back and actually have evolved our designs. Um, traditionally, the compressor manufacturers have always rated around ARI condition, and that's a single point rating. And we've moved to maximizing the energy efficiency of our compressors throughout the entire year. Here are a few examples of compressor performance at various rating conditions. Um, this one's a medium temp example, so we're using a 20 degree EVAP, and we're looking at the, the high condensing point or the ARI condition associated with the, the medium temp condition, which is 2120. You can see here that our hermetic compressors, how they compare versus our scroll compressors, and you can see here two different scroll compressors. One is what we consider our legacy product, the ZSK-4, and the ZSK-A, or the next generation product. And you can see we've actually lowered the ARI rating efficiency level of those compressors. But when, when you look at the low condensing performance of those co same compressors, you actually see the hermetic, what we consider our baseline, and that the legacy scroll actually underperformed the hermetic. However, the next gen, scroll actually performs superior to both options there. One way we like to compare that is by using a weighted EER. That's defined as 20% consideration given at the ARI condition and 80% given at the low condensing condition because you spend most of your time throughout the year at that lower ambient. That gives you a weighted EER and we can actually show a comparison between the technologies, which is reflective of that compressor performance throughout the entire year. So you can see where the Hermetic performs, the legacy scroll, as well as the next gen scroll. And you can see that we've been transitioning our designs to take advantage of those lower condensing points and optimizing our compression technologies to have higher efficiencies at those low condensing points. Therefore, maximizing the efficiency you can get throughout the entire year. So looking at that in terms of a DOE regulation, here is the low temp AWF scores for a walk-in condensing unit that compares the various minimum condensing temperatures that you have throughout the year. Um, on the left-hand scale, you see the low temp AWF, and across the bottom, you can see three separate examples around the 10,000, 15,000, and 20,000 BTUs of capacity generated by that condensing unit. You also see within each of those capacity range, 
a hermetic and scroll example, and then the three bars actually indicate 90 degree condensing, 70 degree min, min condensing, or 50 degree min condensing based on the system um, parameters that your condensing equipment um, offer. And you can see if you limit the condensing to 90 is what we established our baseline on. And you can see the dramatic increase by just moving down to a 70 degree min condensing, you pick up anywhere from 14 to 27% just by moving the min condensing down 20 degrees. That's significant and one of the largest levers that we've seen that you can pull when looking at the condensing unit itself. You can see also by allowing it to um, float down to uh, 50 degree condensing, you can pick up anywhere from 17 to 28 percent by allowing it to float down to seven or 50 degree condensing. You can see that that limitation on the hermetic still exists because it will not float down to that 50 degree minimum condensing. We limit that at 70 degree condensing because of the compressor operating envelope and respecting the, the technology limitations of the valves involved in that compressor. So moving on and talking a little bit about coil performance, this is both the evaporating and condensing coils that are used in the systems that we're discussing today. And even though that all evaporating condensing coils are kind of uniquely designed per application and system, we really measure the coil performance in one variable. It's called the temperature differential. Um, this is looking at the, the difference in temperature between the coil itself and the air that it's either trying to um, refrigerate or the air it's rejecting the heat to. Um, ways to improve that temperature differential is looking at the overall um, surface area of that heat exchanger, and obviously, you know, increasing that surface area will maximize or help out your heat transfer characteristics. One way you can um, look at that is your overall size, and as stated earlier, we expect that heat exchanger sizes will increase um, in order to meet some of these regulations. That is going to result in larger equipment um, and the industry is going to have to take steps to be prepared for that. One other way to minimize that size impact is to look at the fin dens density or actual size or look at the fan blade design you're actually using and the actual fan um, effectiveness. Um, one thing that we've uh, learned over the years is always pull the air across that heat exchanger and never try to push the air. Um, that's because, you know, dust and um, blocked heat exchangers um, can lose their effectiveness significantly if you're trying to push air across that heat exchanger. And the other consideration is, you know, always look at is your coil parallel flow or counter flow. Counter flow heat exchangers will be more effective or taking the step to move to a micro channel um, heat exchanger may be the option to meet, get the energy regulations that, that you're searching for. Now looking at a similar comparison chart um, to see how does TD actually affect the overall um, AWEF. And in this example, we've provided the medium temp AWEF numbers or ratings along the, the scale. Again, we stuck with the 10, 15, and 20,000 BTU example, as well as hermetic and scroll. Now we're looking at the comparisons between a 30 degree TD and a 20 degree TD and as well as a 10 degree TD and the effectiveness, the effect of the energy regulations on those TDs. You can see the baseline established at 30 degree TD. If you go down to 20, you can pick anywhere from eight to 10%. And then if you increase that, or you decrease that TD down to 10 degrees, you can pick up anywhere from 16 to 19% um, depending on the scenario you're looking at. And again, you can see how it compares against hermetic and scroll-based um, compression in the various condensed units that we evaluated here. Moving 
on to the next slide. I'm now going to turn it back over to Brian to bring you through the different fan motors that you have the choice of operating with. Brian? Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, uh, you know, I just wanted to emphasize with those, um, with all the parameters that you can adjust with, with a condenser coil or an evaporator coil, you know, the, the size of the coil, its surface area, the number of rows, what you're doing with the airflow, your shroud, your fan blade, your fin density, all those things we mentioned, you know, really at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is you're trying to minimize that temperature difference. Uh, get your compression ratios to ease up a little bit. The compressor won't have to work as hard. Um, on the other side of that with these heat exchangers is the choice of fan motor, okay, whether you're talking about condenser or evaporator. Um, shaded pole motors have largely gone away. You know, they, they were cheap, but they were inefficient, and uh, most manufacturers have gone in their evaporators or, or condenser fan motors uh, to PSC type motors. They, they are more efficient, they're slightly more costly. Um, but then there's this newer option, the electronically communicated uh, motor or, or ECM motor. Um, very important design option to keep in mind for evaporator fans. And, th and the reason is not only does this fan motor consume less power, but it adds less heat to the refrigerated space, okay? So if you're adding less heat to the refrigerated space, again, your system doesn't have to do as much work, it's not gonna use as much energy and you know everything works out good in the end it's also a very good design option uh, for condenser fan motors um, but again I just really want to emphasize that you know for evaporator fans it also gives you some flexibility with some uh, things different things you can do with the system in terms of uh, varying the speed of that fan motor um, you know being able to cycle it down and save some fan motor powder again though you know you, you have to watch what the effect it has on the whole system um, for example if you're reducing your fan speed on your condenser fan and saving some fan motor power, make sure at the same time that you're not increasing the head pressure, you know, because then again, your compressor is going to be working harder. and It's going to be consuming more power. So, you know, watch how you do that. And um, that little chart there, again, uh, is pretty graphical representation for, for uh, reach-in cases and, and walk-ins, uh, how much annual energy can be saved. And that's a, a nice figure for end users to look at and say, wow, you know, ECM, the choice of ECM motors may involve a little bit more upfront cost, but it's going to have a pretty quick payback. And again, it's one of those design options I think that uh, more and more equipment manufacturers are going to consider because of, the, uh, because of the quick payback and being able to meet the minimum efficiency levels. Uh, two takeaways from, from this chart, uh, just to emphasize the uh, ECM evaporator fan motors, if you look in the upper right-hand corner of that motor improvement selection, um, for walk-ins, using ECM evaporator fan motors is actually a prescriptive requirement. Uh, all new walk-ins have to have unit coolers that use ECM evaporator fan motors. So that will continue even with the new regulations, and, and as well as it should, because it, it is a, a terrific uh, lever to pull, as Kurt said, for increasing system efficiency. The other thing I wanted to do is on the left side talk about the type of of compressor motors. And I'm going to drop right to the bottom and talk about uh, start capacitors and run capacitors. For the small hermetic fractional horsepower compressors that are found in a lot of reach-ins, uh, display cases, and ice machines, okay, um, it's really important to look for compressors that do have the, the start capacitor and the run capacitor. It, it yields a terrific energy improvement in, you know, in the order of 15 to 18 percent just just by having those types of motors and having those additional electro, electrical components. Again, it is a little bit of a cost adder, um, but it's one of those levers that the equipment manufacturers can pull that's pretty simple and is going to see an immediate benefit, immediate payback. Um, all the other numbers that are on there, again, this was from the Department of Energy, uh, and it came from their, you know, justification in these, in you know, for why They've suggested, they don't tell any equipment manufacturer exactly what, you know, all the levers that they have to pull, but they have tried to provide a justification on some of these uh, advanced technology design options and why equipment manufacturers would want to consider those. Defrost schemes, when, it, when we're talking about walk-in um, freezers, okay, so walk-in coolers um, may need defrost, but in terms of the energy calculations, the AWEF calculation, it really only applies to freezers. Um, the, 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 def the defrost energy and the amount of heat that's put into the box during the defrost period figures importantly in those calculations. Um, the Department of Energy, with the, using the 1250 standard and coming up with uh, minimum AWEF levels, allows uh, equipment manufacturers to rely on demand defrost controls 
where you'll only have two and a half defrost per day on average, and those defrost periods can be, you know, uh, f fairly short. So the the Department of Energy has specified what sort of nominal values can be used when you're calculating the AWEF for a condensing unit or, or for a system. Um, one thing we've noted and seen now is that uh, hot gas defrost, uh, while it involves maybe involves some extra piping or extra cost, it's going to typically result in a higher AWEF or a better AWEF than electric defrost would. Again, we've uh, detailed that quite a bit in our last Making Sense webinar, uh, so if you want more details on that, uh, please refer back to that or contact us. Um, the last chart that I'm going to cover before we get to our final polling question is kind of putting this all together. So uh, what we've done here is um, taken a look at a typical glass door uh, reach-in refrigerator. Uh, you can see it consumes 9.42 kilowatt hours per day. Uh, this meets today's uh, federal minimum efficiency levels. But in this example, that uh, energy consumption has to be improved. The energy efficiency has to be improved quite a bit, 31%, just to meet the minimum requirements for 2017. So we took a look at this system, and we tried to figure out, could this level you know, be met with just improvements on, say, the condensing unit side, things we've talked about today. Uh, so, you know, having the, the most efficient um, compressor with that start capacitor, run capacitor, going to the ECM condenser fan motors, doing the things that need to be done to the coil to get that TD down as low as possible. And doing all those things are great. Uh, they, they would improve the efficiency of the condensing unit by 25 to 30 percent. Um, but, but that's not enough for the whole system. So this equipment manufacturer is going to have to not only invest in, you know, the refrigeration technologies, but is also going to have to look at things like controls and lighting. And the little box at the top shows a couple, you know, clear-cut things they can look at, one being the anti-condensate uh, heaters or the anti-sweat heaters, you know, running 100 percent of the time usually is not necessary, especially under the test conditions where these equipments are rated. An anti-sweat heater control um, would, would take that uh, – heater and only run it when it's necessary to keep condensate from forming on the glass door. So again, that's a, that would be a terrific design option. Uh, if the lighting, interior lighting is incandescent lighting that uses a lot of power and adds a lot of heat to the refrigerated space, perhaps uh, LED lighting would be a good option. So there's other things that can be done, and as, as we mentioned, as well as the evaporator fans and the, the type of motors that can be used with there. So different levers you can pull, uh, and at the end of the day, to meet the meet or exceed, you know, the minimum um, efficiency levels. So our our final polling question is like this. Um, I guess it depends on what sort of equipment you're you're thinking about or looking at, but what design options is your organization most likely going to be uh, looking to to do to meet these levels and uh, Low condensing for walk-in coolers and freezers or coil improvements. Choice C is focusing on the compressor. Um, D would be system component upgrades, which could be some of those other things that we talked about, or possibly other technology upgrades. Certainly there's things like insulation and some of the things we haven't covered. So take a second, think about that, answer this polling question, and I'll turn this over to Kurt uh, for the wrap-up and question and answer. <clears throat> Thanks, Brian. We'll give you a few more seconds to um, answer that polling question. And we'll allow the uh, results to roll in here. We can see the results there with almost 20% of our audience working on low condensing options for their systems. And then the next 20% um, also on compression technologies. And the largest one is the system component upgrades, looking at their various fan motors and um, other components, LED lighting and stuff. And then, you know, 12% of the um, audience doing other technologies. We'll continue to monitor that and see what levers the industry continues to pull as we get closer to these DOE regulations and how we understand exactly where the various pieces of equipment um, come towards meeting those regulations. 
Again, we just want to wrap up by looking at all the various levers um, that are out there um, that are recommended by the DOE and the ones that we talked about today, you know, adding run caps to compressors, looking at different compression technologies, um, a suggestion to use ECM uh, fan motors, as well as looking at low ambient um, and coil improvements and defrost schemes overall. Um, stay tuned for future um, webinars. Um, I think we'll look a little bit harder in the compression technology, specifically in enhanced vapor injection. And then also look at um, some various fan motor technologies that we can uh, look at as well. And then, you know, some serious consideration being given to with the EPA regulations that are currently um, out there and pending to delist some of those refrigerants that we're currently used to using today. Um, and these, that forces the question of what alternative refrigerants are out there and how are those going to affect the, these DOE regulations when it comes to energy um, compliance. Um, for more information, um, I'd like to reference you back to um, our Emerson Climate Technologies Making Sense website. There you can find uh, webinars on the walk-in, cooler, and freezers, and really understanding the AWEF and how that's actually um, used to rate those pieces of equipment. There's also a webinar out there conducted by Andre Patnode on low condensing as well as one out there for more by Rajan Rajendran on EPA regulations on delisting refrigerants. And as I mentioned, I look forward to that future webinar on looking at the vapor injected um, scroll technology and how that could be used to meet our uh, upcoming regulations. There's also an E360 forum that's uh, hosted by Emerson. It's our industrial stewardship uh, forums that we hold throughout various regions. Um, in the United States and the upcoming um, yearly um, energy or E360 event, which is actually a three-day conference that will be coming up um, here in the next few months. So we'll be looking for various emails and topics and registration um, opportunities for those events. With that, I'd like to move on to questions from the audience. And now on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder, to participate in the Q&A, click on the question mark icon located in the floating toolbar at the edge of your screen and type your question into the text area and hit send. Please keep the send to default set as all panelists. All right, first question I have here uh, for the panelists here, probably more towards uh, Brian's slides and some of his content. Uh, the question is, do we need to apply for waiver on sandwich preps if the, if the refrigeration system does the double duty, as you stated? Okay, so if you're, if you're going to rate a piece of refrigeration equipment and you can't test it exactly as the test uh, standard prescribes, you can apply for a waiver. You can explain to the DOE how you need to test your equipment, which is typically based on how it would be used in the field, uh, maybe the temperatures, or the ambient that's where it's supposed to be tested, you know, really don't apply. So you can apply for a test waiver. You can explain to the DOE, show them your test reports and what, you know, efficiency levels you're talking about and why you think that, you know, that should be considered. If, however, if your piece of equipment is not covered, if you determine it to be not covered under the regulations, and that includes, you know, the fact that there's not a test procedure that applies or the way that that can be tested, you, you do not need a waiver in that case. Your, your piece of equipment simply just does not apply. It's not covered. Thanks, Brian. I think the next question uh, we have here is is probably for Kurt. Um, is Copeland going to offer fractional scroll compressors in the future? Alan, interesting question. We've actually um, engaged with a few of our OEMs that have requested um, to see if we can potentially come up with fractional horsepower scrolls. Um, with that engagement, we've uh, kicked off a development program and are challenging ourselves to um, develop scrolls all the way down to three-quarter horsepower. That will extend our range significantly from the one and three-quarter horsepower that we have today down to that three-quarter horsepower range. And we see this as a key um, technology that will be allow OEMs to meet the OEM or the DOE regulations and provide them maybe some 
less extringent system changes which will allow them to meet that regulation with only a compressor change, moving from that hermetic compressor to that scroll compression technology. Very good, very interesting. Uh, Brian, this one's probably for you, more of a regulation type question. Uh, the compressor efficiencies you're showing for, are skewed towards remote condensing units. For self-contained refrigerants, we cannot reduce, or refrigerators, excuse me, we cannot reduce the ambient temperatures. What do you suggest? So as I explained, for you know, reach-ins and self-contained display cases, you're testing them in a 75-degree uh, dry bulb environment for, for automatic commercial ice makers and a 90-degree um, ambient. And the, the question is, you, know, you really can't change that. And that's true, uh, but what you can do uh, is, is work hard to try to reduce that TD on your condenser. Um, if you're, for example, if you're an ice machine, if you have your ice machines running in a 90 degree ambient room, but the, the saturated head pressure is say up at uh, 130 degrees, you know, I've got a 40 degree delta across that coil. There's probably some things you can do with the coil, with the airflow, uh, to get that TD down, which means the compressor is going to have to work, is not going to have to work as hard. The compression ratios are going to be easier. And then the, therefore, the compressor is going to uh, consume a lot less power. Now, ideally, I'd love to see TDs across the board at about 10 degrees, right? Um, but that, that may not be feasible. But again, if your uh, TD of your coil is, uh, say, above uh, 20 degrees, then I think there's definitely opportunities for improvement. And we talked a lot about what those you know, could be. You know, the other thing is you, you said there's no, there's no way to improve the compressor efficiency because of that ambient. Again, if it's a small fractional horsepower compressor, um, probably single phase, make sure you have your start caps and your run caps, you have your electrical accessories that are going to allow uh, that compressor motor to run as efficiently as possible. Thanks, Brian. Next question here. Uh, does Emerson have recommendations for start and run capacitors for their fractional hermetic compressors and condensers? Actually, Alan, yes, we do. Uh, if you um, look at our electrical handbook that we publish or our online um, product information, it will list the electrical run cap and um, start cap that we suggest for that hermetic compressor. Fantastic. Thanks, Kurt. Here's a, here's a question on refrigerants. <clears throat> Are there any promising new refrigerants that will improve efficiency? There are many refrigerant options that are out there. Emerson's working hard to identify what refrigerants um, will provide the most energy efficient um, response from the compressor and working to improve approve that refrigerant through the UL qualification process. While we're seeing um, some quick top-of-the-mind refrigerants of 448A, 449A, um, which are the medium pressure refrigerants, and 450A and 513A, we see some slight advantages, but nothing that will um, give you a significant increase over the refrigerants that have you, are available today. Very good. I, you know, I just wanted to add to that. Um, the, you know, the EPA has proposed a phase down of, you know, certain HFC refrigerants, and we all know 404A and 134A are, you know, on that list for certain applications. And, and they've, you know, their, their proposal, they've said that that takes effect into 2016. Um, you know, we think that's likely to push back a little bit. Uh, we expect an EPA final ruling and a new SNAP listing with those refrigerants that Kurt just mentioned. We expect that this summer. So, so stay tuned. There's going to be a lot of good stuff coming from the EPA, and I think it's going to help give us some you know, directions on, uh, on what other refrigerants could be used. Thanks, Brian. You indicated that variable speed fans and compressors would benefit ice machines. How is that, considering that IMs are rated at only one condition? Yeah, um, ice machines are a, a really challenging application. You know, they are just energy rating is done at one condition where the ice machine is basically making as much ice as fast as possible and, you know, using the least amount of energy. And so there's, some, there's, some, there's a lot of trade-offs in, in optimizing an ice machine, you know, how much ice you're going to make versus how much energy, how much water you're going to use. 
you know, the cost of the machine. And so I, I'm not holding up as a design option, you know, any variable speed fans, uh, because uh, in, that, in that sort of application, it probably makes sense to, uh, you know, try to run your fan as much as possible, get, get your best airflow, and just work on getting that uh, TD of that condenser coil down. I think that's probably the number one option we can look at there. Great. Thanks, Brian. Question on uh, the EPA here again. Has Emerson been involved in NAFM's efforts to extend time frame for the EPA phase out to 2022? Yes, we have. We've actually reviewed the, uh, the NOPER and we've, we've commented back and requesting those extensions um, past 2022. 20, 20, um, but we believe that that delay will not occur and that they will delay a few years, but not all the way out to 2022 before they actually delist the refrigerants that they have uh, targeted in that um, NOPR. Thanks, Kurt. I have one question that uh, we answered offline, but I think it probably benefits the audience in general. Question came in, do these DOE regulations apply to test and research, reach in chambers and walk-ins? And the basic answer to that is scientific and medical refrigerators and freezers are exempt from the regulation. Question here on efficiency in walk-ins. Do you believe that changing refrigerants on large system, walk-in coolers and freezers will increase efficiency? 448 does not appear to be more efficient than 404A. As I stated earlier, um, moving from 404A to 448A, um, there will not be a significant advantage for making that, that transition. Um, there will be a slight, you know, one to 2% probably gain by moving to 448, and you'll probably see a, a larger increase in medium temp uh, coolers. However, for low temp, you'll probably see an equivalent performance rating. Thanks, Kurt. Probably another one here for you. Uh, please explain the push versus pull airflow through the heat exchanger coil. Basically, that's um, how you position your fan uh, relative to that heat exchanger. You, you always want to pull your air across the heat exchanger, therefore blowing the air outside the um, system versus trying to push the air into the, the heat exchanger and therefore into the system. Okay, thank you, Kurt. What's Emerson doing with refrigerants in support of the DOE regulations? We are actively reviewing and engaging with the um, refrigerant manufacturers and um, working um, our roadmaps to approve the compressors that will be affected by those um, delistings and hope to have the refrigerants and compressors released sim simultaneously at the same time, as well as providing um, advanced samples to our various um, customers in advance of actually having the compressors fully production released. That allows them to get in front of the test regulations and try to evaluate that um, refrigerant's effectiveness in their overall system when looking at energy efficiency. Great, thanks, Kurt. Uh, one more here on electronics a bit. Uh, does Emerson anticipate new control designs to help achieve DOE regulations? Thanks, Alan. The actual control designs can help improve uh, system efficiency. Um, these include um, adding a head pressure control that allows you to float your head pressure down, therefore reducing the pressure differential of that com uh, that the compressor actually sees. You can also um, float your suction pressure through a suction pressure control device, um, allowing to maximize your evaporating um, temperatures that the compressor sees, therefore increasing the efficiency of the system. And then you can look at fan control um, to help control your evaporator fans as well as your condenser fans to help modulate those fans where appropriate. 
And then you can look at, you know, smart defrost devices, you know, anti-sweat and anti-condensate controllers and heaters, and then also controllers that affect the modulation of that compressor itself to, ma to match the capacity that the system is generating to the actual load being required of the system. All these controls um, are a step in the right direction as it comes to energy efficiency. They need to be balanced for the additional cost that they're adding to the system and the actual energy um, savings that you get from it. Therefore, looking at the overall ROI and total cost of ownership that those controls introduce into the system. All right. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Do you have any associated cost information of the changes you described to meet the DOE regulations? That's the million dollar question, Alan. Um, there is basically no cost determinant to take, say, on my specific system, how much cost are, is that going to increase my overall system cost? However, with the new level of efficiency levels that are out there, um, the DOE has provided a detailed cost estimate and initial payback assumptions on what those various components will add to the cost of the system. And I would um, have the various equipment manufacturers to reference that, as well as bounce those assumptions that they're using off their own experience and uh, procurement group to actually understand when we implement those types of improvements to our system, what cost impacts are we actually going to see, and what is the true benefit that we see in the energy efficiency of the system for the end user, as well as the consideration towards the meeting these regulations. Fantastic. It certainly is a balancing act here, no doubt about it. Well, that's about all the time we have today for uh, for this particular webinar. Thanks, uh, all of you, for the time we have for the questions today. Uh, thanks for your participation. Uh, within approximately 24 hours after this live event, you can access this presentation on demand at www.emersonclimate.com backslash making sense webinars, one word. On behalf of Emerson Climate Technologies, thank you for attending today's Making Sense webinar. Information and registration will be available soon for our next webinar. We hope you can join us again.